Yeah, thank you for um, all tuning in. I'm going to provide, um, as it says, a bit of a legal perspective on the... Uh, um, Tom could play it. Thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, from the, the fire um, regulations. I'm going to look at building regulations quickly, um, where the liability lies in relation to these things, what the case law is telling us to date or not telling us, um, and also just quickly through the reforms that are on their way, just perhaps my comments on them. Paul's got into detail on them and did a far better job than I could, so that's absolutely uh, brilliant. Um, as where we are as lawyers, from a lawyer's point of view, obviously um, we're aware that cladding, fire stopping, the whole fire regulations are now front and centre of the uh, the whole construction industry, um, and it's fair to say that a week does not go past without um, there being some inquiry from um, parties who are own a flat or own a building, and there's an inquiry about their cladding, about their um, their liabilities in terms of a high rise or um, whether wanting to sell it, wanting to buy it, and uh, in relation to that. So that's obviously a live issue for the public. The other thing I'm also um, being heavily involved in is the question of fire stopping in buildings themselves, some who have been uh, erected for quite some time. Um, and Obviously, I mean, since the beginning, I've, I've been on a steep learning curve to understand the not just the fire regulations, but the technical side of it. And I don't claim to have um, the necessary knowledge uh, in relation to that. But it is uh, quite remarkable in relation to fire stopping and everything that's been done. Um, really, a lot of the inadequacies that uh, we're finding uh, and just uh, how that's been dealt with. And a lot of it seems to be, from my point of view, is that it's uh, the responsibility for the actual works um, and even the design of them are being passed down the chain. So it's not even the case that the developer and his professional team are really specifying uh, to the nth degree what the fire stopping should be or the, the, the cladding, et cetera, the details of that. Um, uh, it's going all the way down through the contractor, the design of subcontractors and out to the supplier. And certainly one of the things that we are finding is that it's quite difficult to um, or we're not finding that the uh, part of the supply chain is coming up quite readily with the appropriate test certificates in relation to that. So there's a lot of engineering judgments coming out um, or being proffered. Um, but um, certainly in the situations I'm involved, the test certification um, isn't really there or isn't being proffered. Um, so I'll, I'll perhaps develop on that as we go along, but really to sort of set the scene um, my understanding of the, the legal side of things and what we're looking at and what we're relying on um, goes, all takes us back to, and I appreciate I'm, you know, teaching everyone to suck their eggs and everything, but it forms the basis of what um, we're going to be discussing or what moving on to um, from the legal point of view. So the Building Act 1984, that created the statutory system. We now have, uh, we're having the building regulations of 2010. And we also have the building approved inspectors regulations of 2010. Um, and I'll, we will develop that because that they come up in the case law that we're looking at. And that'll be quite interesting because that could have implications for the um, bills or the building safety bill that Paul was there introduces to us out to us um, in relation to that as well. Um, so what does it cover? It, well, pretty much everything from our point of view. Uh, building work, um, the erection and extension of a building, alteration of it, work required. So if you take the view that um, you have to have an eye on the building regulations uh, for everything in relation to that, then you won't go far wrong. Um, so, and that's whenever a new building is going to be built or proposed, then they have to comply with the five overarching requirements in relation to fire safety. Um, and we'll just quickly run through those. So you have to have a means of warning and escape, uh, internal fire spread um, to inhibit the, I've paraphrased some of this a bit just so I could get them on slide. So it's not word for word lifted from the, um, the regulations. Um, in order to the rate of um, 
fire growth or um, to inhibit it. Um, look at the internal fire spread in relation to the structure so that we'll have the stability. Um, and obviously there's time periods for that. The thing I'm looking at now, we, we, we you know, looking at the wall structure, having a 60 minute fire resistance um, and making sure that happens. That can also uh, change depending on the uh, the building and the other fire safety message in in um, in place. External uh, spread again resist the spread of fire up the walls into another. Uh, in relation to that, um, we saw how in Grenfell that wasn't the case. Um, uh, and then we have access and facilities uh, uh, for the fire service. Um, and then building regulations uh, 2010. Um, and the fascinating thing from a legal point of view is um, you would think as a member of the public that something as uh, crucial as fire um, would be pretty nailed down in the technical side of everything. But as you're you know, no doubt aware, as much as I am, um, a lot of it can be in terms of um, how you deal with things, what you're using um, uh, and, and how the, the, the fire strategy is built with. And built, some buildings are very different. Obviously, if you're an office block and you're looking at um, means of escape and ensuring uh, safety, that will be very different from the one uh, in hospitals, for example. So in an office building, you're looking at having the building regulations will look at um, how many um, fire escapes you have and how many people can go down a particular fire escape and how many of those you have and the doors, etc., and where you're going to exit them. Whereas in a hospital, I mean, finding is that it's not about vertical evacuation, it's about horizontal evacuation, and it's not necessarily about evacuating from the hospital, it's just evacuating from the dangerous area and put them in a safe enough area that will be there long enough for the fire service to um, to come there and deal with the, the fire hazard or the, the problem that's that's arisen. So that's a very so that's quite a, a fascinating area. So as a lawyer, you're always looking for certainty. Um, and in the fire regulations, that can be very difficult because you one, you look at the fire strategy um, then you look at the various details that have the information that you have um, and um, then you can see how that's going to be applied um, into the actual uh, space that you're looking at. And uh, one of the things that Paul mentioned and resonated with me was about having the necessary information. The problem that um, you know, I'm dealing with with clients is that um, the O&M manuals are, are found wanting. The as-built drawings don't have the necessary details. Um, and you guys will know better than I that um, sometimes the as-built drawings are the quite literally the last thing that will be um, will be done if they're done at all, um, because obviously the you know it says, it says what it is on the tin, um, and it's we're finding it very difficult to actually work out what has been built. Um, and as Paul said, we're, they're having to do intrusive surveys both internally and and externally to find out what's actually being built. Um, so uh, no surprise when there's issues in relation to that. Um, so there are amendments to the building regulations as well as um, the other um, matters we've discussed. So reducing height in relation to sprinklers. Um, on that, I for one would be interested to hear people's views about whether um, sprinklers are an answer, whether it's um, full water sprinklers or mist, sprinkler mist systems in relation to that. Um, and then um, signage in, in relation to uh, particular areas that's been amended. Um, so as I said, just uh, pausing there on what the actual you know regulations there, they're to de reduce the fire of risk, obviously the spread of fire, what we're to escape from the premises and uh, to detect the fire, to detect, to the, to detect the fire on the premises and to warn parties and to uh, thereafter, when there is um, um, it is occupied, to ensure that the the, your, the employees are trained and we can mitigate the effects of any fire uh, going forward. Obviously, the other um, important uh, legislation to take account of is the RRO, the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order. This is very important. Um, and again, um, it, when Paul was talking about who the parties are under the Building Safety Bill, that 
resonated because you have provisions who of a similar ilk in the um, under the RRO, who is a responsible person, uh, and that can that can uh, that can be different scenarios in different cases. For example, if I'm acting for a client under a PFI, then um, obviously the NHS trust has a responsibility for its premises. But if they are occupied by a project company who is providing the uh, essential services and the running of the place, then um, you would argue that they have a responsibility under the RRO. Um, the trust has a responsibility to its employees, obviously, um, on, at the premises because it has control over the employees. And then there will also be, for example, the to a lesser extent, but it's it, it highlights the kind of issue and the the shared responsibility. There's a, there can be franchises like um, news agents or others um, in the in an NHS trust. Um, so they will have a certain amount of uh, responsibility under the RRO. Um, they can probably deal with it by you know, making sure that they comply with the trust's um, NHS trust requirements, etc. But that indicate that extrapolates out so that if you have I would take the view and the advice I would give that under the RRO that if you have some kind of control over an area, then you have a responsibility to ensure that the necessary fire um, safety measures are in place that satisfy the uh, fire safety regulations. And as I say, it may be just the case that if you're a tenant, that uh, you are you you make sure that you comply with the landlord's fire strategy. But as a tenant, you would have to make sure that your employees are suitably trained and know where all the egress points, the emergency exits are in relation to that. So you'd obviously have to be uh, very um, careful and make sure that you're aware of that in those circumstances. You can't just assume that somebody else is, is carrying out really is the point. Um, so that's the basis or that's the background in relation to the, the law that we're looking at. Um, and one of the things that I suppose we, we kind of consider now is that um, after Grenfell and um, the Edinburgh Schools, PFI, debacles, etc., um, obviously the liability for these things are looked at quite closely. Um, and you would think that there has there would be a myriad of court cases and following on that. Um, and there has been some, and we will look at that, but it hasn't been quite as straightforward as, as perhaps we might think. Um, so from my point of view, if we're looking at you know, the liability in a development or if something goes wrong, or even sort of setting out the risk, uh, very often your developer or your project company will have the liability under a design and build um, matter or design and build contract. Well, they will have to set out um, their liability or they will provide a warranty about what they're doing, which will be to exercise reasonable skill and care in carrying out the design uh, and the um, specification of the materials. They will have to um, meet the necessary statutory requirements, which will be planning conditions, fire regulations, building regulations, environmental um, regulations and the CDM as well. Um, they will also have to, as I mentioned, make sure that the materials are suitable uh, for their intended purpose. Uh, and one of the things that um, should also be borne in mind um, under a design and build contract is that a contractor um, is responsible to ensure that the works at the end of the day are reasonably reasonably fit for their purpose. It's not an absolute fit for purpose um, obligation. Um, it's under the the courts tell us that it's a reasonably fit for purpose. So it might be a question of degree about the difference in there, but it is an important thing um, to mention in there um, under the um, a design and build contract, for example. Um, and it's one that certainly I make sure that if I'm depending on who I'm acting for, I include or I take out. And it is the, the important thing to be aware of a fitness for purpose. I don't want to go off on a tangent too much. But um, it is possible that the um, a party, a design and build contractor, can exercise reasonable skill and care, uh, but also be held that to that to the account that he hasn't produced the works which are fit for the purpose for which they were intended. Um, and there was a the Hugard case um, 
which is four or five years old, tells us that, and that relates to the construction of uh, uh, concrete platforms um, for wind turbines in the North Sea. Also in there, um, I've included that the landlord can have liability under Section 4 of the Defective Premises Act, as can other parties in relation to dwelling houses. So that's um, a statutory liability for negligence in that um, that you would that is imported into um, the relationship between the parties uh, under that the Defective Premises Act. Um, the other parties you'd be looking at um, to have um, liability. You'd be looking at obviously the architect for the, the specification, um, the design and the original specification. There would be a fire, could be a fire safety engineer there who um, has come up with uh, in the larger projects would be giving us the fire um, strategy um, and producing that. Um, then we're going down to the as well as the design and build contractor who I've just mentioned. You would also have the um, specialist subcontractors um, who, for example, the cladding designer um, in relation to that and having the um, the liability or the responsibility in relation to um, the design and build or the specification on these um, that particular aspect. And then we also have the uh, building inspectors, approved inspectors, who are there to sign off, as it were, in relation to the uh, the actual works. Um, and it might be you might we might think that at the end of the day, well, that's that squares the circle, as it were, and all these parties are going to be taught. But as usual in the legal world, um, it's not quite plain and simple. Um, because if it was plain and simple, you wouldn't have a need for lawyers. So um, whilst you all cheer that sentiment, um, I'll move on to uh, the case law. Um, obviously, as I said, um, there has certainly been a lot of inquiries in relation to um, problems on um, with cladding and various things into high rise flat, for example, uh, and with um, tenant, well, not tenants, leaseholders um, and even freeholders um, asking, well, where does the responsibility, for example, for cladding lie? Um, and the question is that it's not particularly straightforward. Um, we have case law that's built up. I've included Murphy against Brentwood District Council. Um, because that's one of the important cases that we have in relation to our liabilities that we have in the construction uh, uh, contractual matrix. And it's one of the reasons, that case is one of the reasons why we have uh, collateral warranties, because um, the, it's been found that um, it's very difficult to um, be successful in a negligence claim against a party, either a design or construction, um, unless you're able to show that they have accepted that they have a duty of care to you. And Murphy against Brentwood and other cases, the hands against Merton, et cetera, showed us that the courts were not prepared to extend that to um, the local authorities in terms of their, the local authority uh, parties signing off the certificates. But also include um, the architect or the design team not having that uh, tortious liability to other parties, such as a purchaser or a funder, unless um, you know that was very carefully put together. Um, and so the way we've dealt with that is in relation to um, the collateral warranties. That's why we have collateral warranties, because we, um, we create the contractual relationship between the design team, the design and build contractor, and the third parties like the purchaser, funders, and tenants in some cases. Um, and uh, then thereafter, um, that's essentially what uh, you sue on. <coughs> Excuse me. And all these things are important because um, we'll come on to in just a minute, but um, there's the obviously establishing what the, the liabilities are, what your responsibilities are, what you can sue under, so the period of uh, limitation. So just a quick look at some uh, examples in terms of the case law. As I said, um, there's been lots and lots of inquiries from various parties about the responsibilities and what can be done. Um, you can imagine if obviously if somebody's faced with quite a big bill in relation to cladding having to be removed, reinstated or sorted, um, then you know that, that can cause horrific nightmares for these holders. 
um, and even just being able to deal with it with the uh, wake, uh, the wake fire um, attendance, etc., can be um, can be quite expensive. So, in any way, um, there has been some case laws in it, uh, case law in in relation to that, um, and unfortunately, it certainly hasn't gone the way um, that um, the innocent parties would expect. Um, in the first one, first port property services there, that was a flat of 95 apartments where they raised a the, the, the in a number of blocks where they had a service bill of £2.4 million between them. And that was in relating to the replacement of cladding, which was a significant fire risk uh, and the cost of the waking watch. Um, so the first thing the uh, obviously the flat owners did was to challenge this bill because they took the view that um, this was not part of the service charge. And what they'd be looking at is that they were leaseholders in relation to um, the flat that they owned. Um, and so their rights and responsibilities would be set out in the lease. And the lease would include uh, maintenance provisions and the service charge that could be charged uh, back to them. So in terms of being able to say who's responsible for those in the first instance, the first thing you would look at is the documents that they purchased the, their properties on, the leasehold, uh, the leases. Um, and those leases uh, had clauses that referred to the renewing or otherwise treating as necessary the blocks, the obligation to keep the buildings in good and substantial repair order and condition, as well as rectifying or making good any inherent structural defects. So there, that would be their responsibility and the courts found that they, um, they would be required to pay for that um, and so obviously that was unfortunate from their point of view. So notwithstanding that um, they obviously had no input into the construction of the matter, that they have been left with the the the, the fee, the cost of uh, the repair in relation to that. Um, in another one, um, the the sorry, the lessees of the management company. This is another example of having to look at your lease. Um, this is where they took out the flat owners took the case against the management company, um, the original developer and the main contractor, provider of the NHBC policy and also the approved inspector. Again, the, these costs were in about the, 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 the remedial scheme of about three million pounds. Um, in relation to the approved inspector, um, they didn't have a contract with him. They might have had a contract with the others in some uh, some way or other, but they didn't. Um, so they, they used the Defective Premises Act in relation to that. Um, but the Court of Appeal found that the uh, defective premises didn't apply to the approved inspector. So now the defective premises covers covers the part if that if you're involved in the design and construction of a building um, that's a dwelling house, then you owe a duty of care in relation to that. The approved inspector did not have that necessary um, uh, connection um, in relation to that because he was not involved in the design and construction he was signing things off. Um, City is um, another one where we're looking at the, there was 350 apartments in a number um, of that. Again, that's the leases um, where we're seeing that um, under the leases, the landlord covenant with the management company um, in relation to that. Leases were complex, as you can imagine. Um, And that further remedial work was acquired, and there was a big question in relation to that about what the terms of the limitation um, and question on that kind of uh, matter. So the question about that is, as well as looking at leases um, in Sports City and looking with responsibility, you also have to be careful about the limitation period um, in relation to those aspects as well. But again, the householders weren't able to continuously. Um, under, in relation to that, the, the because of the limitation period in relation to that, the six years had expired under the limitation period. Uh, in terms of limitation periods, you have six years to bring a claim um, from the date construction ended effectively, um, if it's a, a, a simple contract, or 12 years if it's a deed, i.e. signed in a particular way uh, to comply with the, the rules and regulations on that. Um, in relation to the other case law, um, 
Zagora, you can say that's against Zurich Insurance and relation and all that. That was what we're looking at again, and as I mentioned, talking about the um, building regulatory orders, etc., and who's going to be responsible for that. Um, looking at the approved um, inspectors, and in particular, first of all, Zagora. Um, as I mentioned, the courts tell us that there is no case, case of negligence or tortious liability against an approved inspector. Now, that's obviously the party signing off on the terms of the building regulation. Uh, so unless the, the parties had a, a collateral warranty in favour or from the approved inspector, um, and it'd be very unusual to have one, then how, how were they going to make sure that they succeeded in relation to that? So they argued that the um, certification issued by the improved inspector uh, and which were relied on by um, Zurich Insurance, etc., were issued fraudulently because the inspector knew that the works um, or was so negligent that there was misrepresentation and issued fraudulent negligence that um, that would mean that they had a, he had a duty of care in relation to make sure that he was not fraudulently negligent, and then that would bring some connection um, to that. Now, the court didn't find in their favour in relation to the particular facts, but the court did say that um, if fraudulent or deceit proven, then they could actually would have a case. So the legal principle was fine, but they didn't decide to get the um, didn't get the uh, they didn't win the case, as it were. So in terms of the other case as well, uh, management company of Herons Court against Hornsley, and this was a, another claim against um, an um, approved inspector. Um, so claimants were looking to sidestep the difficulties with a claim in negligence, um, and they were again were trying to prove deceit um, uh, in relation to um, the breach of the building regulations. Um, so would it render it unfit for habitation under Section 1 of the Defective Premises Act? Um, so again, it's um, the point of principle was accepted by the court, unfortunately, that they were not, um, it was not accepted uh, in terms of the facts of the case on that matter. The RG Securities case um, is important because it tells us that if you are the occupier, own an occupier of a building and that you've um, You've become aware since Grenfell that you have had you have cladding which doesn't comply with building regulations or um, shouldn't have been put there in the first place. Then you are subject to limitation periods against who you could um, take an action against. However, if you're able to show that the party responsible for that cladding has concealed the um, question about the cladding or knew about it and concealed it, um, then that would be a uh, a separate matter and the limitation period would not apply. Now the question of concealment is would be an interesting one. Um, so it's not the courts are not quite clear about what level of concealment do you need to have. Is it just that you, you're not making yourself aware of what is actually put in place or are you actually aware of that the cladding for example um, did not comply with building regulations at the time? Um, but you were happy to receive a building regulation certificate and didn't alert anyone to it, and uh, you moved on in relation to that aspect. So that would also be something uh, worth looking at. It could also be the case that, um, not that um, the matter was um, concealed at the time of completion, but there could be for the developer or a project company, for example, in the PFI, could have carried out their own surveys after the Grenfell to know about how to deal with things and just didn't necessarily make the other parties aware of that. So arguably you could say that that was a, a question in relation to the um, concealment as well. And you'd certainly argue that against a limitation period. Uh, and the last case law there is, it's not a, a British one or an English one, it's an Australian one. Um, and it's, it's, it's really there for a, a, a So um, this was in relation to um, where a uh, um, on a balcony, um, by one of the residents led to a fire um, in the building and the evacuation of 400 people. 
Um, so it took 11 minutes for the fire to spread up the external face of the building right up to the 28th to the 21st floor. Um, so found that the uh, aluminium composite panels were not um, compliant to uh, the Australian um, codes in relation to that. So they found in favour of the um, proprietors against the contractor. But the contractor was successful in uh, being able to um, defray the costs of that, the majority of the costs down the line to the fire engineer, the building surveyor, and uh, and the architect. So I didn't put the architect there. Um, so the, the liability was found, and then it was passed down the line in relation to that those parties. So that's not binding in relation to um, UK law, um, but um, it, it's well known that we can quote Commonwealth cases for their persuasiveness. Um, so it's always useful to have a um, sight on that. That if you have, if you can prove the contractual nexus, then it is possibility to have your claim uh, in relation to that. Um, obviously, the actual uh, law covering the code and the approved the building surveyor were different, but um, you know bear that in mind. Um, again, um, I'm not going to. I won't go into over in any detail the building safety bill, which uh, Paul covered in excellent detail. Um, again, um, just looking at it about the uh, terms of the what they're going to introduce, the building safety regulator uh, being part of the HSE um, and the regulatory um, regime and the higher risk buildings. Just uh, as I mentioned, bearing in mind under the RRO, who's going to be the accountable person? And then um, questions about a building safety manager um, in relation to the building. Does the landlord point somebody? Does the tenant have their own? How is that all going to gel together uh, in relation to that? Um, so how much actually survived going through the court process? Sorry, not the court process, the um, committee process in Parliament uh, will be interesting. So again, the fire safety bill um, in relation um, to that aspect will be um, interesting again. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, that brings me to an end. Um, we have questions uh, in due course.